yeah, thank you for uh, attending. Uh, thanks to the committee um, for your time and your uh, interest. Um, I'll just get right into it. So, so the work in this thesis is motivated by the problem of autonomous robotic exploration. And here we can see which here we can see robots exploring Mars, um, exploring underground caves, performing surveying in mines, and being asked to drive fast on off-road terrain. And so in these environments and on these tasks, robots can often encounter tricky situations that they've never seen before. So for a robot to function autonomously in these environments, they need to be able to learn and adapt from their experiences. So in terms of learning, when we talk about learning, we have to think about deep learning. Uh, deep learning is an enormous paradigm shift in computing. Um, before deep learning, the approach to autonomy and um, is often based on hand design algorithms where the performance of these algorithms is bounded by our human ingenuity. How, how good of an algorithm can we design? How clever can we be? And there are usually clear assumptions and rigorous proofs. Uh, with the advent of deep learning, we, we have a, a paradigm shift. So these algorithms are, you can think of, we can think of them as being designed by data, where their performance is bounded by the amount of data we have and the amount of computation that we can throw at the problem. And this is great for some problems, but uh, there's some drawbacks here. We end up with a kind of a black box behavior. We're not really sure what's going on inside this uh, huge network. So we still need some human cleverness to uh, use these networks uh, in a way that makes sense. Especially when it comes to robotics. We would like to use deep learning, but robots have some very specific requirements in order to be actually useful. And especially when it comes to safety, we need them to be safe. We don't want them to harm themselves or other people. Um, we need them to be able to you know, safely and carefully investigate things that they don't understand. And at the same time, we don't want them to be overly cautious. We want them to be agile and, and be able to accomplish uh, the, their mission. And so that brings us to the hypothesis of this dissertation, which is that applying deep learning based uncertainty quantification methods in robotics enables uh, risk and a uh, risk aware control trajectory optimization and planning. And the key here is uncertainty quantification. So what is uncertainty quantification and, and why is it important for deep learning? Um, well, when we talk about uncertainty, we can think about two types of uncertainty. The first is aleatoric uncertainty, and that's uncertainty that comes from uh, the data itself. So if we look at this graph, we have some uh, underlying system, this red line that we wanna learn about. And we have some, we've gathered these data samples. And the aleatoric uncertainty is the noise that's inherent within these samples. And the second type of, type of uncertainty we can talk about is epistemic uncertainty. And this is uncertainty that comes from a lack of data. And in, in this graph, uh, to continue the example, in the region that we don't have any data at all, we are pretty uncertain about what's going on, what's the underlying system. And so to safely use deep learning in robotics, uh, we would like to quantify both types of uncertainty. And especially we want to know what the network does not know. And that will give us some indication of when we can trust the network or not. So there, there are many ways to quantify uncertainty in deep learning and this dissertation is focusing on two approaches. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to these methods, um, which we'll discuss a little bit. The, the first approach is to assume a distribution for the data and find the parameters of the distribution. So for example, we can assume that we have some Gaussian uncertainty with a mean and a variance, and we can try to learn what this mean and variance is from the data by maximizing the likelihood of the data given the model and the parameters. And the second approach is we want to avoid assumptions of the underlying distribution. And we, we can simply observe the occurrences of the data and directly regress the quantities of interest that were the, that the quantities that we're interested in, such as quantiles, uh, which are bounding the data the expected tail value, the mean, et cetera. So our approach is 
like this. We want to find problems that are faced by autonomously exploring robots in these kind of challenging environments. We want to leverage uncertainty quantifying deep learning methods for safety critical systems. We want to find ways to obtain guarantees of safety, feasibility, and risk. And we want to enable adaptation and learning for solving some of these challenging problems. So our approach is presenting four key contributions. And the first one is at the level of controls. So at this level, we incorporate uncertainty uh, quantifying deep learning for high-speed safety. Um, at the level of trajectory optimization, we present a contribution on learning how to uh, quantify uncert how uncertainty evolves over time. At the level of planning, we introduce a method for risk-aware kinodynamic planning for challenging environments. And at the level of traversability, where we want to decide where and where not to go, um, we introduce a method for learning this traversability, uh, learning the tail risks of this traversability when there are unknown distributions. So first I'll dive into the, the first topic, which is uh, on the level of controls. So this work uh, I'll present was published at ICRA 2020. I'd, I'd like to thank my co-authors. Um, and the title of this work is Balsa Bayesian Learning-Based Safety and Adaptation. So when we talk about deep learning and controls, we're generally interested in learning uh, changes or differences in dynamics. And a good example of some differences uh, in dynamics are uh, if you have a, a one meter long RC car driving on sand and gravel, uh, the dynamics will behave very differently than a five meter long passenger vehicle driving on ice and snow. But ideally we can, we can have a method that is able to generalize to, to both situations. And so the idea here is to use uncertainty quantifying neural networks to ensure safety when we are adapting our dynamics. And we accomplish control through control the up and off functions, and we accomplish safety through control barrier functions. We also want to handle control constraints, and we also want this approach to be applicable for real-time control. So we make a few assumptions to set up the problem. Um, first, let's suppose that we have a system that looks like this, it composed, composed of positions uh, x1 and velocities x2, and we have our, some dynamics, some control inputs, and some noise. And we want to learn the uh, unknown dynamics. We, we have some system that's, you know, maybe it's a car, it's driving around. And we can have a, an approximate model of this, maybe it's a kinodynamic model. And it's not going to be exact all the time, but it'll give some, um, you know, some prior, some, some knowledge about you know, what the behavior, behavior of the system might be like. And we'll have some modeling error between the true dynamics and our um, initial model. So our goal is to learn what this modeling error is using a neural network. Uh, the second assumption we wanna to make to, to make the problem a little more focused is we, we assume some reference trajectory that our controller should track. And this will allow us to write out the error dynamics. So this is how the error, the difference between the robot and the reference trajectory, um, how that error will evolve. So our goal now is to approximate this unknown uh, error term delta uh, with this adaptive control term. And we wanna try to cancel these terms out if we can. So, to do this, we see that in the error dynamics, we have two unknown terms that appear. We have delta and we have sigma, the uh, model error and uh, an unknown uh, uncertainty. And the goal is to learn an approximation of these terms in the form of a neural network. So let, let's assume for a moment that we have this model. Uh, we can set, if we do, we can set this adaptive control term to uh, the mean here, m. And hopefully then these terms will cancel out and we'll be left with this simpler equation. Uh, now in practice, this might not be true. We might not be able to cancel it out completely. Um, this model that we learn may not be equal to delta. Um, there's a more rigorous approach that we can take, which is to assume that this error is bounded. And the analysis that we have will, will still hold. But for now, for simplicity's sake, let's assume that this error is zero. 
we want to focus on what's going on with this uncertainty here in the model. And so the question remains, how do we, how can we learn this uncertainty? And uh, how can we incorporate our knowledge of this uncertainty into the control? So to do this, we collect some data and our data is going to reflect uh, the difference between uh, the true dynamics and our reference model uh, or our initial model. So we, we collect this data in pairs X and Y and we train a model and we can assume that, let's assume that this model is, that the data has a Gaussian distribution with mean and a variance. And we wanna plug this back into our error dynamics. And so now our goal is to find the control, control term u mu qp here to ensure that this error is going to tend to zero. And we also wanna ensure, ensure that the robot is gonna stay safe. So to try to guarantee both of these things, both safety and stability, we set up this optimization problem, which is quadratic in the controls mu qp, and it's linear in these constraints. And the first constraint is to ensure safety. And if we can satisfy this constraint, then we know that the system, the error of the system will tend to zero. And if we can satisfy the second constraint, this is the control barrier function, we know that the system will not enter any set that we consider unsafe. Uh, at the same time, we can add some control constraints to this optimization problem because we need controls that are uh, actually feasible for the robot to execute. So here we see what happens when we deploy this approach on a toy problem. And the red regions are unsafe regions. And the robot starts on the left. And there's a red, there's a black uh, trajectory that we want to track. That's our reference trajectory. And our approach is in green. And we're comparing against a variety of other approaches, which um, you know, drop some of the uh, constraints or assumptions that we've made. And we see that compared to these other approaches, our method is able to track the reference trajectory as best as it can. Uh, at the same time though, it, it maintains a safe margin away from the uh, non-safe regions. And as, the, as time progresses, as it updates uh, the model, that margin starts to shrink and it starts to get closer and closer to the safer regions, to the, to the unsafe regions. So we can see that we're collecting more data, we're updating the network from time to time, and we have less uncertainty over time and our prediction errors decreased over time. And over the course of learning, our method is still respecting the uh, safety constraints that we've specified. So here we compare uh, this uh, uncertainty quantifying deep uh, learning network with a more classical method, Gaussian processes. Um, we also compare against a fancier recurrent neural network kind of architecture, uh, which is also doing uncertainty quantification. And we see that they're, they're performing similarly. So that's good. Um, we also demonstrate this method on an RC car driving on sandy terrain. Um, we can see that once we turn adaptation on, the robot is able to track this figure eight uh, trajectory that we have uh, much better. And here we have uh, just a little video showing that, you know, at the same time it's tracking the trajectory. It's also slowing down for an obstacle that appeared um, moving around it. And let's see. And we also show, you know, in in hardware that uh, we're able to adapt to these uh, unknown dynamics. So once we turn adaptation on, we see that it's able to track the trajectory much better. So some overall thoughts about this approach. Uh, we're able to incorporate some. We're able to incorporate uncertainty quantifying deep learning for a safety controller. And we were able to show online adaptation in real time on hardware. So that's the uh, nice points of it. The, the, there's some drawbacks, however. Uh, one important drawback is that this uh, quadratic programming problem, this optimization problem, may not always be feasible, especially when you have control constraints. Um, and that, that can be dangerous. You may not have enough uh, control authority to get you out of a, a sticky situation. And a second kind of related issue is that the controller is a, is a one time step optimization. And this can sometimes result in myopic behavior or result in you not being able to, uh, or finding out that you, your problem is now infeasible. So this is, this is motivating uh, a couple of questions. 
the first is can we use uncertainty quantifying deep learning to obtain safety guarantees over longer horizons not just one time step and secondly can we handle control constraints and thirdly can we guarantee that a feasible solution will always exist so that brings us to the second contribution of this talk uh, at the level of trajectory optimization where we want to characterize how uncertainty evolves over time so that we can answer these questions in the affirmative. So this is work that was presented at RSS in 2020, deep learning tubes for tube MPC. And so the overall concept here is we want to construct a model of the system to use for planning or trajectory optimization. And unfortunately, there's uncertainty in that system. There's uncertainty in how well we've learned that system. And so how do we characterize that uncertainty? In the previous work, we used we assumed a Gaussian distribution. But this approach might be, it has some drawbacks. So to illustrate what happens when we assume things are Gaussian, let's suppose we have this system with some noise, uh, some learned model, and we have some distribution of the dynamics. We assume that they're Gaussian for one time step. So at the next time step, we have a, a Gaussian distributed um, uncertainty. Uh, that's great for one time step, but if we want to propagate this distribution forward for more than one time step, we're going to run into a problem. This, this integral here, where we're uh, integrating over um, the next time step, t plus two, uh, this integral is intractable. So there, there are various methods for trying to approximate this integral, the most popular one being moment matching, um, but these approximations can easily fail. So to how, to give an illustrative example, suppose we have these two different nonlinear dynamical systems. We have sampling, we're sampling trajectories uh, using these dynamics. Um, these trajectories are shown in uh, blue, blue, green, cyan. Um, and we use a Gaussian process to learn the dynamics, and we use moment matching to approximate the distribution of these trajectories that we're propagating forward in time. And we show three sigma bounds in red of this moment matching method. And we can see that on the left, the moment matching method is severely over approximating the true uh, bounds of the distribution. And on the right, it's under approximating. And this is because moment matching is assuming a Gaussian distribution at each time step and is trying to approximate a non-Gaussian distribution with a Gaussian one. So if we want to quantify uncertainty, which might be non-Gaussian, skewed, asymmetric, multimodal, or heteroscedastic, which means that the variance is, is varying, is changing a lot. Uh, we may need a different approach and so our idea is that for in order to guarantee safety for controls and planning uh, in, in the face of uncertainty we're only interested in the tails of the distribution and the probability of some of those bounds being violated so what we do is we propose a method which is based on quantile deep regression to learn these probability bounds of the true distribution without any restrictive assumptions on the form of the distribution or the underlying dynamics and we can see our method at work in the green bounds. And so our method is less prone to overestimating or underestimating the, the tails of the distribution. So how do we do this? Well, what we can do is we can construct a state and time varying tube, which is meant to contain the majority of the trajectories at some specified probability level. So one way to construct this tube is we have some center of the tube, some dynamics that describe how the center of the tube moves and then we have some dynamics that describe uh, how the width of that tube around that center and how the width of that tube changes over time. And so our goal is to use a neural network to learn this F uh, omega. How does the tube change over time? So we can accomplish this using quantile regression. And quantile regression is a method for uh, learning the, the bounds, the quantile bounds on a distribution. And it's as simple as we have this loss function, which when we minimize this loss function, then with probability alpha, with the quantile probability that we specify, we have an upper bound uh, on the distribution. So that's great. Um, but more than that, we're, we're interested in using these tubes for MPC, for planning, for control. So in order to guarantee that uh, our MPC problem is going to be recursively feasible, it, that it, it will always be feasible. We can always find a solution uh, at each time step. We need to ensure that the created tube, the learned tube, satisfies a monotonicity property. And this is uh, simply saying that a, a tube that, two, if you have two tubes and it, one is inside the other one, when you propagate it forward in time by one time step, the smaller one will still be smaller than the, the bigger one. 
And so we can enforce this monotonicity with an additional loss term that is penalizing non-monotonicity. And finally, we, we add one more piece to the puzzle, which is that in a similar way that Gaussian processes are quantifying uncertainty that come from a lack of data, we also can quantify data uncertainty uh, with this approach. Um, and there are a variety of, variety of methods for doing so with, with neural networks. In this work, we're using uh, orthonormal certificates, which is a particular, particular method. Um, but in, in, in theory, any epistemic uh, uncertainty quantification method can be used. So with these, we have these three loss functions. We combine them, we, we train a network, we learn this too. And now we can set up a nonlinear MPC problem. And we can guarantee recursive feasibility for this problem. And we can guarantee constraint satisfaction uh, at some uh, level of probability. And we want to be able to use these tubes. We can use these tubes in different ways. So the first kind of way we could use this tube in, in setting up an MPC problem is to assume that we're given a tracking controller. We can then use a um, reference trajectory as the center of the tube. And the width of the tube describes how closely the trajectories are tracking the reference. Um, and that's OK, uh, but the, the margin, the, the width of that tube can be pretty high if, if the tracking is not good. So the second approach is to learn a model of the tracking error and then learn the width of the distribution of trajectories around the tracking error dynamics. And this results in a much narrower tube, which allows for more aggressive maneuvers. The third approach is to directly learn a dynamics model. If we, we don't have a reference uh, trajectory, we don't, have, we don't have knowledge of our dynamics, we can learn the dynamics first. Then we can learn a tube to characterize how closely the true trajectories match the learned dynamics. So here we plot a comparison on a linear system and the learned bounds from our method are shown in green. And the, some, we have some analytic bounds that we've computed in red at a 95% confidence level. And in cyan, we show 100 sample trajectories. And we can see that while the learned method is slightly underestimating the analytic bounds, uh, they still remain safe margins for, for bounding the curve. We can also validate that uh, the epistemic uncertainty learning is working well. We can vary the amount of training data that we, we give to the network. And we see that the fraction of trajectories that stay in the tube at our desired probability is the same. So that means that as we have more epistemic uncertainty, we have less data, the, the bounds are bigger. So we demonstrate this approach works well as on a high dimensional system. Uh, here's a 3D quadrotor navigating around some obstacles, some cylinder obstacles. Um, and we have 12 states and four inputs. So to give some summarizing thoughts on this approach, um, we are able to show that deep quantile deep learning enables learning uncertainty distributions that evolve over time. We're able to show that this can be applied to real-time robust MPC uh, using these learned tubes and that we have recursive feasibility guarantees. Now, some of the drawbacks to this method are that uh, if we want to handle uncertainty that's coming from the environment, uh, that can be difficult to do. Uh, the problem becomes much higher dimensional and propagating these tubes forward in time uh, can become difficult to learn these tubes. And the second issue is that these learned tubes, they're capturing a quantile bound, but they're not quant capturing what happens if you exceed this bound. They're not capturing the tail risk. So that's motivating this question of a very real world motivated question of what happens when these uncertainty bounds are violated. This is inevitable when you're working with real robots. And the second question is how can we better handle uncertainty which is coming from the environment and from perception, which is in practice where a lot of uncertainty is coming from. And just to kind of motivate uh, these questions a little more, we see some robots driving around and uh, unfortunately this video is not playing, but here a robot is getting stuck. Um, basically it doesn't, it, there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, is, that, is that step or is that metal piece uh, traversable or not? And, and what's gonna happen to the dynamics as it traverses that, that region? So now we come to the third section of uh, this dissertation, which is on at the planning level. Uh, we want to examine this question of uh, incorporating uncertainty and planning over tail risks um, from, uh, Oh, sorry, incorporating uncertainty from the environment. Uh, 
And this work is uh, presented at RSS this year. Um, and uh, many thanks to my uh, co-authors, uh, Kian, Yuki, Anushri, Joel, and Ali. So we're, we're talking about what happens when these bounds that we've learned are violated. Um, and we wanna make sure that the robot behaves in a safe and graceful way in those cases, because these cases happen very often. And so in the previous work, uh, these bounds that we've, we've learned can be thought of as a worst case approach, where we just wanna stay on one side of the bound at, at all costs. But in, in real life, bounds are often being violated. So we wanna think about a way, uh, we wanna think about how much it will cost to violate those bounds. What are the consequences if we do violate them? And that's ex especially important when there's a lot of uncertainty in the system, maybe coming from perception, um, from unknown uh, risks in the, in the environment, um, we want to be able to reason about what is an affordable risk to take and, and the cost of uh, what happens beyond that bound. And to try to address this question, uh, we present a holistic framework, which is assessing these affordable risks and then performing risk aware planning over them. And this framework is trying to account for localization error, sensor noise. Uh, it, it's trying to do the planning and kinodynamic trajectory optimization and controls. And so first, let's start with how we assess tail risks. So there are very various risk factors within an environment. So for example, you might have uh, slopes, uh, obstacles, the robot can tip over or slip. And assessing these risks is not always straightforward because we have a lot of uncertainty. Um, there might be uncertainty where, like where are the points in the point cloud located? What does your environment look like? You have localization error and things like that. So we treat these risks as random variables and with a distribution that depends on this uncertainty. So the question is, how do we, how do we compute these risks and how do we uh, combine them? So what we do is we, we use a, a risk measure and one particular uh, instance of a risk or one particular type of risk measure is known as the conditional value at risk. And this is simply the expected value of the tail of the distribution that's lying past some uh, quantile threshold. So the quantile threshold is the same thing as the value at risk this bar. So that's the quantile level, alpha, alpha probability. And then the C bar, the, the conditional value at risk is just the expected value of the, uh, the random variable past this bound. And normally these risk measures are, are pretty difficult to work with, but by picking a normal distribution, we get a closed form estimate for C bar. So this makes it nice and easy to combine different risk factors from different um, sources. And it also makes it easy to assess the risk along a given path. So here we see what these risks are looking like uh, in action. Let's see if I can. Play. There we go. So uh, top left, we have the robot work, walking around in a hazardous cave type of environment. And we have LIDAR point clouds. And then we have, we compute various risks uh, of different kinds, a slope, obstacle, and step. And then we can combine these risks together into one uh, C bar cost. So once we have this risk, now we wanna use it for safety, for risk aware planning. And here's how we do that. We do it in a, in a hierarchical way. Um, we have a high level geometric planner. It only minimizes the risk along the path and it doesn't think about anything else. It's a, in our case, we're using A-star. Um, and then we have a lower level kinodynamic planner that is taking into account a variety of things, different costs um, and constraints, um, including uh, obstacle constraints, um, dynamics constraints, velocity constraints. And it has a shorter planning horizon, of uh, six seconds. And we set up a convex optimization problem to handle all of these different costs and constraints and, and included in the cost is the c-bar um you know it's a kind of a general framework so we can have different uh, dynamics models um and we convexify obstacles and then we have convex uh constraints for slope and for the orientation of the robot on the slope and we introduce a hybrid sampling and optimization uh method mpc method for solving this problem 
where we have some heuristic and sampled paths. We try to pick the best one and then we use it as an initial guess for the uh, optimization problem. So here are some results. Uh, on the left, we have uh, a legged robot navigating through a cave, trying to reach the end of it and avoiding some risky rocks. These rocks have some distribution of risk and we're not quite sure how risky they are. So it's avoiding them. And on the right, uh, we have a differential drive robot trying to make its way through some very narrow passages without hitting anything. So we've deployed this approach on different robots and in different environments. And we've shown that this approach is able to handle localization noise and uncertain risks uh, better than a worst case planner or an average base planner. Uh, unfortunately, this video is not playing, but that's all right. So this is the solution that we're using for uh, JPL's uh, DARPA sub -t subterranean challenge. And uh, with this approach, we're able to successfully explore these different environments with um, kilom several kilometer you know, ranges, um, very cluttered and un unknown and uncertain environments. And uh, we have a, a final competition coming up in, in September. Um, so the nice thing about this approach is we've, um, it, it, it can integrate well with and interact well with other modules, including like coverage planning or mission planning. It can provide risk awareness to, to other modules. It's being field hardened and actively developed. And so that gives us a, a bit of a unique insight on in what are some of the problems that are left to solve using this, this kind of a, a model-based approach and, and where can learning come in? So let me give a, some summary of this approach. Um, so we have an efficient navigation and planning method for tail risks, for risk awareness and safety. Uh, we're able to account for a variety of kinodynamic constraints and costs. And it's been field hardened, which is ex exposing problems that re are requiring uncertainty quantification deep learning to solve. So what are those problems? So one of them is that we've made some assumption about Gaussian uncertainty. And this tail risk is depending on that assumption. But in practice, the true distribution of the risks and the probability, the, the, the traversability costs is, is very difficult to assess, um, to come up with a really accurate model of exactly how the robot will do and what's the distribution of, of you know, the cost that the robot experiences on some terrain, that's gonna be very hard to model. So this is motivated, motivating the question of, can we learn the distribution of traversability costs to more accurately capture these tail risks? So that brings us to the last portion of this, um, of these contributions, which is on traversability and learning traversability tail risks with unknown distributions. So yeah, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, people who I've had great discussions with, uh, Kentuck and Anushri, Kian, Ali, and the Bengals. So the main question here is, can we learn traversability risks directly without using the many modeling assumptions that we've described in the previous section? And one of the problems with the previous approach is that it's highly sensitive to um, artifacts that are affecting the pipeline. Um, so we can see here, we have a, a cost map. It's a 40 meter by 40 meter representing some walls and this is in a cave. And we have a uh, artifact resulting from a two and a half D elevation map um, problem. And then there's an artifact from a, a person walking around causing these smears in the cost map. And then we also have just general sensor noise and, and localization uncertainty. So another difficulty is that we have to assume a Gaussian distribution. And in reality, these risks are highly non-Gaussian. And there's also the difficulty of computing uh, the value at risk bar and C bar for non-Gaussian distribution. So the question is, can we use uncertainty quantifying deep learning to provide an answer to, to these issues? So let's see if we can do this. So let's try to learn VAR and CVAR directly. So if we, again, we consider the traversability assessment model, we, we have a traversability cost. It's a random variable and it's a function of the environment and the robot's current state. So we wanna learn the distribution of this random variable, especially the, the tail of the distribution. So we have the, the value at risk and the conditional value at risk. So to learn these quantities, we introduce the following three losses. So the first loss is for uh, bar, value at risk, which is the same as a, a, the hinge loss. It's, it's just the quantile regression that we described before, um, because bar is, is just the quantile. And the second loss is for C bar, 
And this is assuming that we have uh, a known var, then we can compute the expected value of the tail. And the third loss is a monotonic loss to ensure that both var and c var are, are monotonic with respect to the probability level, alpha, probability level uh, which is alpha. So as alpha increases, both var and c var should increase. So combined, we get the total loss to train the network. And here we have a, a toy problem. We want to check that this approach uh, makes sense. And we have a random variable y. Uh, and it depends on x. And so this distribution of y, it's multimodal. As we get over here, we have two modes, and it, the variance is changing uh, with x. And in the lower plot, we see that for when x is minus 2 over here, we have this distribution. When x is 0 in the middle here, we have this kind of bimodal distribution. And when x is over here and at x equals 2, we have a distribution that's strongly bimodal. And when we train a network on these data points, we end up with um, uh, these curves. The model is producing these, these curves where the solid line is var and the dotted line is C var for different alpha values, uh, 0.1, 0.5, 0 0.9. So we can see that when we take these learned values and we plot them against the, the PDF, um, that they are indeed capturing the tail risk and the expected value of the tail. So this is giving us confidence to try this on a much larger and, and more challenging problem. So let's have a look at this data that we're going to use to, to try to tackle this problem. We have six different environments, uh, each with their own characteristics. They vary in size, in length, and width, and difficulty. And we build a network, which is trying to take in the point cloud data. And we take in raw point cloud data here. Um, we can then transform this data into 2D input features. We also provide a known, a known mask, uh, which tells you where you have data and where you don't, where you have these, these point cloud data. Um, and then an alpha probability uh, channel is provided to the network. And that lets the network know what level of alpha it should produce. And then this is fed into an image segmentation type of neural network. In this case, we have a partial convolution uh, unit kind of a network with skip connections. And then the output is we have two channels. We have uh, var and we have c var. Actually, when, in practice, we use c var minus var, uh, which you can see plotted here. And so now we, we're going to train this network using the collected cost map data. Uh, and these cost collected data are samples from the true distribution of traversability costs. So here we can see the, some inputs uh, what the inputs to the network look like. Uh, each row is one sample provided to the, to the network. Um, and we have six representative samples from each environment, six, up to each of the six environments. And we have elevation map information here. Um, and then we have a histogram of point cloud data in increasing uh, height. So these just marking uh, the number of uh, points in, in each uh, Z bin. So, and here's some examples of what the input alpha channel uh, can look like. So it ranges between zero and one. And during training, we use a randomly generated uh, alpha channel. And, and it should have a uniform distribution between zero and one to make sure that the network knows how to produce var and var values for any alpha value we want. And so during test time, we can specify uh, any shape of alpha values that we like. So for example, this radial pattern where alpha is high in the center and decaying to zero as you, as you move out, um, it might be something uh, useful in, in practice. So here we show some results. After the network has been trained, it takes about a day to train, um, given the amount of data we have. The first column shows the sample traversability cost. So we can think of this as kind of a ground truth, although it's not always uh, going to be accurate. There's a distribution there. And the next three columns show uh, CVAR at varying levels of alpha. 0.1, 0.5, and 0.9. And we can see that as alpha is increasing, the risk is increasing, especially more, it's increasing more in some regions. And so the next three columns show are showing C var minus uh, var at, a, at an alpha level of 0.1. Um, and basically this is helping us visualize uh, what, are, what are the tail risks that C var is uh, capturing. And the last column is uh, C var minus var when, when uh, the alpha channel is this radially decaying pattern. And we can see that uh, as expected, when there's low alpha values, the risk is low. So let, let's see if we can evaluate this uh, network and, and see 
uh, how it compares to some other methods. Um, so we can use these three metrics to quantify how well our, our model is learning the tail risks. And the first metric is an implied quantile, which is just measuring how accurate the, the quantile, the VAR, uh, has been learned. And the second metric is a pseudo R2 metric for VAR, which is measuring how much the regressed uh, quantile error, um, which is this quantity here, compares to the constant quantile uh, computed over the data. And the third metric is accomplishing a similar thing for C bar. And so for these latter two metrics, uh, a value closer to one is better. And a value less than zero means that the model that we've learned is doing worse than just using a constant uh, bar or C bar value. So here we plot the performance of the model on all the data sets. On the left, we see we have some box plots um, of the evaluation metrics, implied alpha bar R2, C bar R2. And uh, each sample in this box plot is uh, a sample from the test data set. And on the right, we do the same thing, except we're looking at the individual data sets, the average of the individual data sets one by one. So we can compare what the, how the data sets do, and we can see that some are um, harder to, to do than others. But overall, the model is performing well. The implied alpha is uh, close to a line from zero to one, which is expected. And var r2 and c var r2 are both close to one. And when we compare this method to some other baseline methods, we're, we're pretty happy. We can compare against uh, the handcrafted models that are being used in uh, uh, we in, we're talked about in step in the previous uh, work, and as well as a, a model that just learns the mean, this L1 loss. Um, we can also compare against a model that is assuming a Gaussian distribution and learning a mean and a variance and re reconstructing the bar and C bar values from this uh, learned Gaussian distribution. So for almost all values of alpha, our, our method is outperforming and is, is doing what, what is expected. We also notice that this approach is more computationally efficient than the handcrafted approach. We get a nearly 5x uh, speed up. Uh, and this is true whether or not we use a CPU or a GPU. So here's some a little more insight into what the model has learned. Um, here we have a, a tricky situation where there's there's a low step in this environment. It looks like this in, in the cameras, uh, maybe about 10, 10, 10 centimeters high. And it's difficult for the handcrafted cost um, to assess this risk, especially when it's far away. If you have a little bit of localization uh, noise or error in, in yaw or pitch, um, the points that are projected way out in the distance, they're going to vary highly. So. It's going to be hard to assess exactly how high this little step is. And in fact, in this case, when the robot got there, it fell over. So it's, it's a tricky situation. And our uh, method is showing a smooth increase in alpha, uh, I'm sorry, in the risk as alpha is increasing. So here alpha is increasing from 0.1 to 0.9. And this step is appearing here in the middle uh, along this, this line. And we can see that it's uh, increasing sharply uh, as alpha is increasing. And this is in contrast to some other regions like the walls, where from even when alpha is low, we have high risk. It's an, it's an obvious obstacle. So we can see that the network has indeed learned uh, something about the distribution of risk and how that distribution is different for different types of risk. And finally, we come back to the first uh, cost map with the artifacts that we, we saw. And we can see that our learned model has determined that these artifacts um, are not actually posing a large risk. And that's because they occur infrequently enough that they don't appear when we have a risk value set to something like 0.5. And we can see that when we vary the alpha level, we see that for higher alpha, we see some of these risks uh, reappear. So that means that the user can set whatever threshold of alpha that they like, and that can allow the robot to be more aggressive or, or more conservative. So some summarizing thoughts on this approach. Um, we presented a novel approach for transforming point cloud data into risk cost maps. Uh, we're able to more accurately capture tail risk uh, CVAR without assumptions on the type of distribution. And this allows for safer risk aware navigation and challenging terrain. And some of the drawbacks here or, or future work is that this learned risk metric, it's a static risk metric. It doesn't account for uh, path dependence. So that means it's, it's useful for creating risk constraints as obstacles, but it's not as useful for determining what the risk along a path that you take is. And uh, a second maybe 
problem, pro not problem, but uh, caveat is that it's a, depending on an existing traversability cost assessment. So if there are ways to, um, you know, avoid that, um, maybe in a self-supervised way, um, that would be interesting as well. So now I'd like to conclude this talk uh, with just a couple of remarks. Um, first, uh, we've shown that uh, uncertainty quantifying deep learning enables establishing safety guarantees, ensuring feasibility, and quantifying risks more accurately. We've demonstrated this at the level of control, trajectory optimization, planning, and traversability. And these methods are going to benefit as we have increases in data, in, in computation, and uh, improvements in neural network architectures, improvements in uncertainty quantifying methods. Um, so some future directions where uncertainty quantifying deep learning can play a large role in robotics, hopefully. And one of them might, one of these uh, future directions might be learning traversability costs from experience. Um, so if you go somewhere and you find it was, dif it was uh, difficult to, to be there, um, you can maybe incorporate that into your learning. Um, Another future direction might be uh, thinking about localization and sensor uncertainty in the loop with planning. So uh, perception aware planning um, and incorporating uncertainty quantification there. Um, another future direction for tube MPC for learning the bounds on, on tubes uh, would be interesting to look at uh, chance constraint programming and how can we vary the risk along the tube um, to get to optimize some uh, objective. And similar to that kind of idea might be to think about information gain versus risk, uh, especially for exploring these environments. We have a lot of uh, uncertainty and we'd like to reduce that uncertainty. And we could think about that in terms of uh, trading off between risk and information gain. So finally, I'd like to thank everyone who made this work possible, my uh, collaborators and uh, lab mates and friends. Um, I'd like to thank my advisor, Bangalos. Um, I'd like to thank the committee and everyone at uh, Team CoStar at JPL. Um, this photo is from when we found out we, we took first place at the Urban Circuit um, at, at the DARPA competition. I'd like to thank uh, John Reeder at Nywick um, and all, the, all my lab mates at uh, the ACDS lab. So thank you very much. <laughs>